grown up in the original environment of these traditions. But if Jainism is to be more widely recognized as an intellectual tradition that can contribute to tomorrow's world, Jaina thinkers should take an example from the Buddhists. I am convinced that Jainism as a worldview has much to offer to the world because it is not a Shunyavada, it is not a Mayavada like Madhyamaka Buddhism is or like Advaita Vedanta is. It is a Tattvavada, it is a doctrine that offers an explanation for the real world. And with this, I think I have stayed within the limit of my time. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Vinay Jain, a biophysicist and radiation biologist. Uh, he's a professor emeritus at JVPI Ladnu, an advisor at the International School of Jain Studies, New Delhi. He has been working as a professional, as a nuclear medical person at Physical Laboratory, Ahmedabad, Ames, Delhi, and so many other institutions. His current interest is in Lesia, Meditation, Forgiveness, and Behavioral Modification. Here I present Dr. Vinay Jain. Jain. My topic uh, today is psychobiological and spiritual aspects in the evolution of supreme forgiveness. Why this topic? Why I have selected this topic? At the JVBI and Bhagavan Mahavir International Center, and uh, that program is about enhancing ahimsa. Now we work with a very simple hypothesis. Ahimsa can be enhanced if we reduce aggression and if we enhance forgiveness. How can we do that? We again hypothesize that the spiritual practices like preksha meditation can do the job. And so we are investigating this empirically in uh, human subjects. The effects of preksha dhyan on aggressiveness in primary school children, the results were uh, obtained so far are very encouraging and they were presented by my colleague Kushbu Jain yesterday in the experimental technique section. Now uh, I will talk about a little about forgiveness. See, we live in a world which is getting more and more interdependent and interconnected. Interconnected in globalized world, internet, television, mobile phones, and whatnot. So we depend upon each other. And when you interact very strongly, then conflicts are bound to arise. And these conflicts sometimes cause hurt and injuries. And this gives rise to violence sometimes and counter-violence. And then you cause more and more damage. In contrast, forgiveness is a positive and beneficial response, though rare and very difficult to practice. And various individuals differ tremendously in their capacity to forgive. Let's go a little bit in detail. Now, in this slide, if you can give it attention for a few seconds, the dynamics of responses to perceived injustice or hurt or injury are presented in a simple model. Most common is, as you know, the strategy for tit for tat. If a hurt has been done, if an injustice has been done, then you pay in the same coin. Khun ka badla khun se. An eye for an eye. Mahatma Gandhi said, if we follow this strategy, the world will be blind very soon. Well, we have not yet become blind, though the violence is increasing, but we are certainly uh, have impaired our vision. 
Now, what is the remedy? Remedy is forgiveness. The, uh, in this diagram shown by green color. And there are many methods by which we can enhance forgiveness, but I think that the spiritual practices are among the best, as we are seeing. Now, let's go a little more deeper. Why does one feel hurt? Because that's the basic uh, for all these responses. Now, again, we hypothesize, and there is a lot of evidence for it, Heart is grounded in the concept of ego. Feeling hurt involves the interactions of the embodied self with the universe, non-self and others. Embodied self or embodied soul, as we'll come to it later. Freud said that the root of ego lie in the body ego. And the feelings of attachment develop from the biological sensation and experience of touch between the infant and the mother, according to the modern psychologists. So attachment, as you know, is very important in, in Jainism also. Karma, moni karma. And this moni karma or attachment extends the self-image from the body ego to psychological domains of inner experience, giving rise to me and mine. Now, from the biological perspective, development of ego strengthens the survival instinct and is therefore a vital protection mechanism in the struggle for existence. And any perceived threat to the ego creates a state of stress and induces a feeling of hurt or injury. Now, for a lay person, absence of feelings of resentment or anger for a perceived offense, mistake or injury by an offender, that is uh, the meaning of forgiveness. And this also involves sometimes no demand for punishment or restitution with or without attached conditions of an apology. Or it. The experts they believe that uh, forgiveness is a multifaceted complex and it can be considered from different perspectives, psychobiological perspectives and the spiritual perspectives. In the psychobiological perspectives, what we will deal today a little bit on adaptive strategy that evolved to advance survival, the evolutionary uh, perspectives for forgiveness. Now, as you know, in the struggle for existence, competition for resources was the most important, and the survival instinct fit um, uh, in the natural selection. Constant competition and conflict among group members erode social cohesion. Now, as the society, as we depended more on the social group, as the social groups involved in the social groups the uh, important point is cooperation and competition erodes social cohesion. So for sustainable development, it, the, our behavior should be based more on cooperation and altruistic behavior. A balance between competitive, cooperative and altruistic behavior is critical. So according to evolutionary biology, the forgiveness evolved as a regulatory mechanism for restoration of interpersonal relationships and it provides restorative justice and survival advantage and it regulates the uh, competitive spirit. So from this uh, perspective, what are the different categories of forgiveness? There are many kinds of forgiveness. In, uh, the diagram we first of all uh, said that non-forgiveness, non-forgiveness is the most common response and conditional responses, conditional forgiveness is the next most uh, important uh, response which includes cooperativeness and it's dependent on the psychobiological aspects and it also in, in, involves the expression of ego. 
Whereas the unconditional forgiveness, uh, that is forgiveness without any conditions, without any atonement, and supreme forgiveness, as we shall come later, they depend on altruism and spirituality. Altruism is providing benefit to others without considering self-interest, consideration of others. As we heard today also in the video today in the morning, aggressiveness and non-forgiveness could under some circumstances deter recurrence of the offense and thereby may offer survival advantage. And therefore, the physiological processes and mechanisms developed to enable fight or flight response and the physiological process. We are not going in deeper into that. But there uh, are maybe some genetic basis of non-forgiveness traits, and this is being investigated just in the beginning, in the autonomic nervous system activities. If they get imbalanced, then they may give rise to aggressiveness. For example, if the sympathetic uh, res uh, nervous system um, is uh, more stimulated and the parasympathetic is depressed, then the anger and aggressiveness increases. Similarly, levels of central neurotransmitters, dopamine and serotonin, serotonin have been shown to correlate with the aggressiveness and forgiveness. Now, as uh, we have seen, there are so many disadvantages of non-forgiveness, damage of social relationships, development of chronic stress, giving rise to ill health, and uh, co conflicts remain unresolved, and continuation of the vicious cycle of violence and counter-violence, threat of survival, and therefore conditional forgiveness evolved, uh, shown in this uh, slide. And in this in important element was the element of apology, atonement, repentance, so if the offender uh, realizes his mistake and uh, uh, apologizes, then conditional forgiveness, which gives rise again to uh, eventually to survival advantage. Now we see all, all uh, in our daily newspapers and TV, our parliamentarians in the parliament create a hangama on any, every slight thing, they feel threatened, they feel hurt, and they demand apologies. The apologies are seldom given. But this question of hurt, again, I want to stress one thing by an example. A few months ago, you have seen that the Maharashtra government banned selling of meat. And during the Payurshan power of chance. And this created a lot of opposition, a lot of discussion, and they said that uh, the human rights of non-vegetarians have been hurt. But then what about animal rights? So what I'm saying is that people have become so sensitive that uh, we have talked about Anikantwad, but anyway, the general feelings are that anything slightly which is, goes against your perception of the world, against your way of life, you feel hurt. And you demand apologies from all others. But this really doesn't work. Because the, there are several limitations of apology and conditional forgiveness. Communication of feelings of remorse or guilt, even if genuinely felt, and admission of wrongdoing by the offenders to the victims may be blocked due to self-oriented egoistic reasons. The ego comes in between. They, they, even if they realize that they have done something wrong, they would not like to apologize. Secondly, apologies may not ev even lead to forgiveness always. That may depend on the intensity of the crime, the nature of the crime, and uh, so many other things. So the result is that uh, 
the offender and the victim and all others continue to suffer. But it has certain advantages still. For example, in the intimate relations, offenders are more likely to apologize and showing remorse and victims are more likely to empathize with the offender if the relationship is close, satisfactory and committed. So in the family life, for example, it can offer an advantage and we have seen all, even in the wider scale the example of Bill and Hillary Clinton. Bill Clinton apologized to the whole nation, to his family and everybody and things were again normal. So relationship quality has been observed to strongly correlate with higher forgiveness in empirical studies done in the West and in the individualistic societies like the, some of the European nations and America they have investigated. But as compared to uh, collectivist society, uh, for example in China and Japan, which have a slightly different view also in India, the, this may not play a very big role. In India, no investigations have been done so far, but with China and uh, Japan there are some results. So culture plays a big role again. Now forgiveness uh, reduces distress, as is shown here. Some of the neurobiology of forgiveness is being explored. Some beginnings have been made and some parts of the brain and the neural circuitry have been shown to be activated in, when uh, the subject is asked for forgiveness. <coughs> now this uh, I've already told you that this is our basic hypothesis that forgiveness should enhance ahimsa. Empirical studies have shown that dispositional forgiveness is inversely related to vengeance. If this is true, enhancing forgiveness should reduce feelings of revenge and violence. Now, spiritual perspectives. So the unconditional forgiveness and supreme forgiveness as we come here, they depends on the spirituality more. Unconditional forgiveness evolves from altruism, that is benefit others at the cost of self-interest and equanimity, the realization of the intrinsic equal value of all life. The unconditional forgiveness can facilitate breaking of the vicious cycle of violence and counter-violence. This is very important uh, because some of the people object to unconditional forgiveness saying that it is, is immoral, number one, because it does not pro provide punishment and uh, justice, and second, it is impossible to practice. But uh, we'll see that unconditional forgiveness does not justify or condone the wrongdoing, and the justice and punishment can take its own course. But unconditional or altruistic forgiveness inspires gratitude in the offender, and encourages sustainable reconciliation. The community is transformed from victim preparator to a community rooted in the shared worth of all individuals. These are the, the um, many advantages of unconditional forgiveness and therefore it's very valuable for the society. Concept of forgiveness in Jain philosophy. Now, as compared to that uh, embodied soul, here what we say is that uttam kshama or supreme forbearance is an intrinsic natural attribute of the jiva. Now this is the main difference between the concept of a living being which is consisting of the soul embodied by matter, embodied by physical body and karmshari. And the famous uh, saying from Tattvarsut, the living beings function to help each other. Now, what is this concept of Uttam Shama? How it, that is the quality of the pure passionless state of equanimity, <coughs> Vitragata, and is expressed by the Vitrag soul spontaneously, unilaterally, unconditionally, and universally. See, the conditional forgiveness may take a long time due to various processes and it can, uh, if you go back to that uh, diagram, 
it uh, takes a long time and at various stages it can happen. Now in the sansaric uh, jiva, it is restricted, but it can be enhanced by spiritual practices, for example, in the Pyushan Parv or practice of Kayotsar meditation. Now this is what I wanted to tell you specifically that uh, Kayotsarga uh, experience uh, has been shown to enhance disposition to forgive. Uh, Samni Amar Pragyaji uh, has a paper here where she has shown that the Priksha meditation enhances uh, forgiveness and Kayotsarga is one of the important components of uh, Priksha meditation. Now, Kayatsarg, here, this is based on Bhedvigyan. Self is not the body. It is the body. It is, uh, it is in the body. The soul is in the body, but it's different from the body. That is Bhedvigyan. And Kayatsarg meditation reduces attachment, that is moha, to the body and depletes the ego making the person less sensitive to hurt and more supportive to forgiveness. It leads to self-purification and development of the conscious state of forgiveness. And we have carried out some preliminary investigations uh, on Kayatsar, and we found that, first of all, the activity of the sympathetic nervous system goes down very rapidly, within a couple of minutes, if uh, people uh, practice this Kayotsag meditation. And therefore, it, it can uh, certainly make very physiological changes in the response of the body towards aggression or towards forgiveness. And uh, w uh, what I want to say is that eventually, the if depletion of the ego is there completely, vitrakta is there, then the subject will not feel any hurt. A person having a psychic disposition with high uttam kshama does not feel hurt by any offense, is not angry, has no desire for revenge, and attains a higher spiritual state. So forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it, saying by Mark Twain. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Sudhir Shah. He's from the Yale University, USA, and his subject is conflict resolution, championing on Anekantva. So while we are waiting, can I request all of you to get up, stretch, and sit down? Take, take 15 seconds. Yeah, this is the presentation. Right? <laughs> so as I was preparing for this presentation, uh